Good evening, and welcome to tonight's conversation, Representation Matters, Art, Space, and Racial Restitution. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Haynes Gallery at Wake Forest University, Wake Forest University's Slavery, Race, and Memory Project, and Wake the Arts. My name is Corey Walker. I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities, and I will moderate tonight's conversation. This evening's conversation is inspired by the new exhibition in the Haynes Gallery, Ex Explorations of Self, Black Portraiture from the Cochrane Collection. Curated by Wake Forest University students, the exhibition consists of 41 works from the Cochrane Collection, including Mel Edwards' Chains. Edwards' work, Chains, is an apt one to open our conversation uh, this evening. Edward's uh, etching challenges us to begin to think through not only his work, but more importantly, it serves as an invitation for us to think together. Indeed, Edwards, Edwards reminds us of this when he states, the whole purpose of abstract art is to provoke thought. It is such an invitation and a practice which invites us as a community to truly think together this rich exhibition, to consider form, texture, technique, and tradition, to also think the complexities of history and memory. If we consider this exhibition as a provocation for thought and expanding on Edward's original invitation, we readily recognize that the concepts, ideas, and language we will use will reflect the ways in which these works confront us, challenge us, and frustrate any simple correspondence theory of reference or preconceived ideas of the work of art and the artist. The space of thinking opens us to new ideas, new expanses of the imagination, and new possibilities for institutions to welcome a communal thought practice inspired by art. There are no guarantees as we think the rich layers of meaning in the works that we'll see in this exhibition and that we'll discuss this evening, because these conversations will enable us to embark on a journey of discovery and a journey of remembering to use the words of the late Toni Morrison. Edward's piece, Chains, reminds us that, reminds us further that abstraction is a given, a wise teaching for as we translate impulse, idea, and experience shaped by the flows of space and time, we're trying to communicate and represent a form and an experience for others to engage. The wisdom of Edward's teaching is on his insistence of for our acute attention to the qualities of things and their refusal to be confined by the categories of the same. Edwards uh, reminds us of this in the closing remarks of his, in his famous Whitney exhibition when he underscores this point by writing, my use of art as a life to work past the confines of any set of classifications and conditions is a critical attempt at this point in history, for all systems have proven inadequate. Chains draws our attention to the physicality of Edward's work, his use of steel and so much of his, his uh, structural uh, work harkens back to the magic that he first saw performed by his father when his father shaped a knife from a piece of steel. It also gestures to the sport that Edward so loved as a former University of Southern California football player. But it also speaks to something else. Edwards confronts a material that is heavy, obdurate, and resilient to his initial efforts. 
It is this confrontation with cultural, material, and spiritual dimensions and meanings of things that shapes and informs his work and our thinking. But not simply in a linear manner. Edwards reminds us, responding to those who associate chains exclusively with slavery, he notes, I am always aware that it's got a symbolic reading already in hand and hard for people to get away from. So I don't want to try to get them away from that. But the word chain is the device for connecting. If you metaphorically define chains, they become love. Chain of love, chain of fools, chain, chain, chain. It's also symbolically chains of kinship, chains of linkage. The problem is not the chain, it's how people use it. We take up Edward's invitation this evening and not only thanking chains, but also thanking this exquisite exhibition. Joining us this evening for this wonderful exploration of the many dimensions of this exhibition are Jay Curley, Omari Simmons, and Jamie Anderson. Jay Curley is Associate Professor of Art History in the Department of Art at Wake Forest University, where he teaches classes on the art of the 20th century and on the 20th and 21st centuries and the history of photography. He has published widely on American and European post-war art and photography and is the author of two books, A Conspiracy of Images, Andy Warhol, Gerhard Rector, and the Art of the Cold War, and Global Art and the Cold War. Omari Scott Simmons, is the Howard L. Olick Professor of Law at Wake Forest University School of Law. He is a nationally recognized expert on corporate governance and higher education policy and frequently lectures on these topics to academic and non-academic audiences across the country. He is the author of the new book, Potential on the Periphery, College Access from the Ground Up. And he is the former co-owner of Red Piano 2 Art Gallery in St. Helena Island, South Carolina. And he currently serves as a trustee of the Asheville Art Museum. With her talent for flawlessly intersecting architecture, art, and exhibition design, Jamie Anderson draws her inspiration from solving challenging problems, creative people, creating, uh, drawing on the ideas of creative people and the inherent need for beauty. Her career is a balance of making, practice, design, and teaching continuously focused on cultural institutions. Originally an artist turned exhibits fabricator, she studied architecture, leading to her first tenure with Smith Group. Jamie went on to serve as a senior architect and an ex exhibitor designer at the National Gallery of Art, where she designed hundreds of special exhibitions and other projects before returning to Smith Group to lead the cultural practice. Some notable projects that Jamie has headed up include the National Museum of the American Indian, the Gilcrease Museum of American Art, the Lumpkin Slave Jail Site, Devil's Half Acre Interpretive Site, and the renovation and expansion of the Franklin Institute. Please join me in welcoming Jay, Omari, and Jamie for tonight's conversation. Jay, I want to begin with you. We have this wonderful exhibition curated by our Wake Forest students. Talk to us a bit about the ideas inspiring this exhibition and the ideas that go into putting all of this together selecting 41 works out of a collection, out of the Cochrane collection that consists of over 400 works. Sure, I mean, uh, first of all, I just wanna thank, uh, thank you, Corey and my panelists. It's an honor to be here and um, I'm so, so thrilled to talk about this uh, exhibition and all of its ramifications. 
Um, so the exhibition came about like many things in life um, through social and professional connections. Um, Paul Bright, who is the director of this Haynes Gallery where I'm sitting right now, um, and also the collectors, Wes and Missy Cochran, they had a common friend. And this, so we all got together for dinner, um, you know, when the Cochran's came to town. And over that dinner, um, we sort of started talking about the ways that art is so important in fostering and sustaining important and difficult conversations, um, especially about things like race, um, and you know, also about, uh, especially on college campuses, on liberal arts universities. So the germ of the exhibition sort of took hold that night, uh, you know, over wine and, and food um, um, at, at Paul Bright's house. Um, so we really, and the Cochran's generously um, agreed to lend, you know, um, a number of their works for the show um, with the, you know, with the caveat, you know, with the, with the agreement that students would select his works. Um, so I taught a class last spring um, called uh, Exhibiting Contemporary African American Art, where the students basically did a lot of research um, and, you know, the pandemic forced us all on Zoom, you know, um, we were able to put together, they were able to assemble this exhibition. Um, and so all the works, the selection of the works, the wall text, the forthcoming catalog, this is all the, the work of those, um, of those students. And let me just say, you know, as I'm aware that as a, you know, as a, as a white, uh, white male trained in white man modernism um, in graduate school, that I am perhaps not the ideal person to lead this seminar. Um, but Wake Forest doesn't have a, you know, an art historian trained in African American art. So I just um, you know, spent the entire winter break just reading as much as I could. But also, you know, making that part of the part of the course as well, thinking about my own, you know, my own um, my own privilege and my own uh, positionality, but also encouraging students to think about that as well. So a lot of our conversations were also about the university and thinking about our position here. But I want to turn to this one work um, that, that is Willie Cole's American Domestic. It's behind me. I'm sorry, Zoom is hard to figure out your left and right um, behind me here, and um, I think we can cue the image up as well. And I think this um, rule, this work can show us a lot about what the students were thinking about. Um, you might recognize that Willie Cole here from this work in 2016 is using Grant Wood's very famous painting, American Gothic from 1930 as his source material. Um, and, and American Gothic is a double portrait of two you know, Iowa farmers. Um, and it really is, it's transcended its role as a painting. It's become an American icon, American Gothic. Um, and by collaging African masks over the faces of these two figures, uh, Cole alludes to the Americans who are not pictured here, um, the black men and women whose unpaid labor during the, during the period of slavery and the un, you know, underpaid, la underpaid labor during the ages of Jim Crow, you know, th that labor built this nation. And also Willie Cole is known for using these sort of iron sort of branding marks here. And they have many ways we can interpret these. Uh, Willie Cole has said for this painting, it alludes to the domestic labor that, uh, that many black women uh, undertook, but also as a really astute student pointed out, the, 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 the iron looks kind of like the slave ship diagram that we, you know, we, we've seen growing up in textbooks that you know, the, the horrific conditions in the, you know, during the, the, pass the crossing of the, of the Middle Passage. And so Willie Cole also you know, references subtly the histories of slavery here. So in short, Cole recasts and reclaims this foundational image of American art for black America. And students came to see this work of art as one that can encapsulate the show's themes. They all were really drawn to it. It was a unanimous choice for the show and the ways that there are many repressed stories of, of black Americans lingering behind images that have come to define American art, America, and indeed Wake Forest University itself. So that's sort of a general introduction to how we began thinking about this show. Thanks so much, Jay. You really highlight uh, some of the ideas that go into that gone that went into uh, developing the show, really challenging students to confront the depth and complexity of the art itself, and also using art as a provocation for conversation. And in many ways, uh, Willie Cole's piece really challenges us and opens up the opportunity for us to begin to rethink America and rethink the imagination of what America is. Omari, I want to turn to you because you're bringing in a, a, a very distinctive uh, perspective to, the, to tonight's conversation. You're a well-recognized uh, business law expert. Uh, you hold an endowed chair at a, one of the top law schools at the nation, uh, in the nation. But more importantly, you're a former gallery owner. And not only just any gallery owner, you're a co-owner of a gallery 
down on historic St. Helena Island in South Carolina. Can you talk to us a bit about the imagination that opens up to the art, arts world in St. Helena Island and some of your gallery practices uh, that you develop down there in your gallery? Let me unmute myself. Uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone. It's an honor to be associated with uh, this wonderful collection and also the presentations of, of the students. I, in thinking about it and carrying on with what Corey had mentioned uh, previously, this idea of the chain and the idea of connecting things, um, using it in that way. And for me, if I could uh, characterize uh, my experience with the gallery, it's a linkage between the past, present, and future. And so uh, I have been associated, I had been associated with the Red Piano Gallery, at least my family, for about 13 years. Uh, me personally, probably over the past since 2013 until June 6 when we closed. I want to give um, all credit to my co-owner, Mary Mack, who's also an artist uh, from the island her, herself, and she is the spirit and driving force behind the gallery. But what makes it uh, significant, it's a community-based art gallery, but St. Helena Island, the actual environment and the location is extremely important because some of the issues that we're talking about in terms of the experience of black Americans uh, in this country come through that area. Um, it is one of the places where perhaps the largest amount of slaved Africans came um, to this country. And then also uh, St. Helena Island is associated with uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction particularly the Sea Islands and on St. Helena in particular is where the Union Army came roughly around 1861. White planta plantation owners left and ultimately uh, via the Port Royal experiment you had formerly enslaved West Africans who actually engaged in self-sufficiency, independence, and also education. Um, the gallery is located around the corner from the Penn Center which is one of the first schools for formerly enslaved West Africans in this particular country. It's also a part of the Reconstruction Area National Monument, which is a part of the U.S. Park Service. The gallery, in terms of who we represent, over its 30-year history, actually, since 1989, represented as many as 150 artists, uh, both fine uh, craft, um, as well as what we call self-taught. One of the most famous artists from that area of the self-taught variety is Sam Doyle, who is from St. Helena Island. For those of you who have to paint some context as far as the scenery and the environment, if you've seen uh, the Julie Dash movie, Daughters of the Dust, that was filmed on St. Helena Island with a little bit of a pop culture reference. Uh, that movie inspired Beyonce's musical film, Lemonade, and so new generations are being exposed to that. Similarly, uh, for the older people in the crowd, like myself, if you've seen Forrest Gump, multiple scenes were filmed around Beaufort. So some of those beautiful scenes that you actually pictured, that's where the gallery is actually at. Um, I think when you think about the artists, uh, when I approach it, the past, present, and future, it's this linkage, but also those enduring qualities and values that you think about. Uh, independence, ownership, uh, the idea of simplicity, but so much complexity in doing just simple things. Of uh, the idea of family and the things that connect people. And I think when I look at the gallery, why it was important, because it's community-based, it brought all types of people together, but it gave um, the artists an opportunity to show their extreme talents, both locally, nationally, and also internationally. And it sort of served as a hub. It served as a hub of people coming together and coming back to that theme concerning the chain. It held the community together, so to speak. And I think its connection to the Penn Center and other things in that area also were key. Um, in light of that, what I'd like to do now is turn attention to a piece by Elizabeth Catlett. Um, in addition to um, owning the gallery for a period of time, I also am a collector, but I'm, I'm fascinated by Elizabeth Catlett, not just because of the work she presents, but also because of the person. And I think it's a good example of some of the things we're going to talk about, hopefully, as the discussion moves on. This piece, Virginia, um, is a lithograph, but uh, Catlett is also known not only for her printmaking, but also for her um, elegant sculptures. Um, she is influenced uh, generally by um, abstraction, but also uh, figurative. But you can see the influences of um, African art, 
and culture, as well as Mexican art and culture as well. Uh, Catlin has a little bit of a connection to North Carolina in terms of her, her mother, I believe, was from North Carolina, perhaps Durham. Um, but also in 1940, uh, she became the first black woman to receive a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Iowa. Um, right now, I believe there's a dormitory on the campus of University of Iowa, and it's named after her. But when she attended that school, she could not stay in the dorm, although she was studying. Um, although this doesn't capture it, you can see the dignity, the dignity that's displayed and the, the person in it. This is actually an image that is not reflective of the entire body of work of Elizabeth Catlett. Uh, in fact, she was very much more proactive um, as an activist, speaking to social and political issues. So as whereas this one's labeled Virginia, there are other pieces that some people may be familiar with, uh, such as Homage to the Black Panthers, Malcolm X Speaks for Us, Civil Rights Congress, and Black is Beautiful. Um, interestingly enough, she spent a lot of her career in Mexico. Um, there was a point in time in her career where she was not able to come back into the US. She was labeled an undesirable alien. She renounced her citizenship in 1962, and then eventually regained her citizenship in 2002. I think it's good to focus on her because when we talk about the artistic imagination um, and some of the sacrifices people make, she was pretty unrelenting um, and was really um, envisioned her art as a way to keep the conversation going and thinking about some of these issues. So I'll just stop there and let the conversation proceed. Thank you so much, Amari. You really highlight not only uh, what the gallery in uh, South Carolina at St. Helena Island means um, in terms of a hub for community, uh, exemplifying the values of a people, past, present, and future, but more importantly, your discussion of Elizabeth Catlett reminds us that the imagination that's opened up through this exhibition and through the works curated by the students not only remind us and challenge us in terms of our ideas of what America is, it also expands the ways in which we are all connected globally in a very uh, deep and very resonant planetary sense. So that really, really enables us to turn to Jamie. And before I get to you, Jamie, I want to remind our audience that's gathered with us this evening that you, if you look on your uh, Zoom box, you have a Q&A feature. If you have a question that you'd like to pose to any of the speakers tonight, feel free to uh, hit, uh, press on that Q&A button, write your question in, and we'll make sure that we get uh, our conversationalist uh, to respond to your question this evening. Jamie, Omari talked to us intensely about a gallery that served as a community practice, a gallery that opened up that reflected the values of community, that not only reflected those values in a current moment, but also connected to a past that was not only South Carolina, but was also global. Talk to us a bit about your work and your practice uh, your, at Smith Group and beyond of ex using these ideas that expand the imagination and building new institutions for community. Well, first of all, and I hope everybody can hear me okay, but um, thank you all. Thanks to Wake Forest for inviting me to join the conversation tonight. Thanks for, to you, Corey, for facilitating and to the other panelists as well. And equally, just to remind everybody about this link between the past and the present and the potential future. I'm a Wake alum, and so a lot of my time when I think about the Haynes Gallery and I think about the art department in Wake Forest, is also being a little bit nostalgic about my past. Um, so yes, we at Smith Group, I, I lead the cultural practice and that um, of course has been kind of the gathering of a lot of the work that I've been um, working on since leaving Wake Forest. And of course, cultural work and cultural identity and architecture and art that surrounds that cultural identity um, relates to not only buildings, but to landscapes, to sites of significance, uh, visitor centers, uh, collections, facilities, or repositories for these objects that you know are the heart of humanity, and of course museums and galleries. Um, 
We have an incredibly diverse um, and integrated team at Smith Group. And so part of my job is to, to help um, match the right voices of the practitioners that work in our firm with the voices of the community to, to um, build and design um, these places. Um, you know, and so it's a true mix between art and architecture and design and community. Um, I'm not an art historian, even though I, I dabbled in a bit of art history while I was at Wake Forest, um, but I can speak to the museums and, and cultural and, and, and representation. Um, the Juan Logan Pray For Me print, I'll, I'll just hold in the background as I'm speaking, um, partially because there's something um, rather provocative about the image. There's something potentially spatial about the image. Um, and I love the connection and discourse that, that can be created by, by works of art like this. Um, museum collections are notoriously delinquent um, in the representation of African-American voices, um, in the representation of African-American artists and their work. Um, and this is a, a fundamental discourse that's currently happening in the realm of cultural work in museums and galleries. Um, and museums and cultural entities have parallel discrepancies in their own staff as well. Um, Jay alluded to it um, in speaking about his own position. Um, I can speak to it as well. Uh, fewer than 3% of licensed architects um, in the United States are African American. And so collectively, striving to better our representation um, and make sure that we are um, part of the communities for which we are, are crafting and sharing our voices is of paramount importance. Um, for any discourse around public space and museum and gallery space, I think it's really crucial to have a, a quick um, outline summary of the history of museums and galleries and, and displaying works of art. You know, these spaces essentially began as cabinets of curiosities, places where, you know, um, generally speaking, wealthy um, men would go and, and plunk art and artifacts from spaces that they would visit and then take them home with them and showcase them in private rooms. This transferred um, into essentially taking stuff of plundering, of wars, of things like that, where you had nations um, at, at war with one another and gathering artwork in order to, you know, showcase them in their, in their home countries and cities. You know, philanthropy then quickly followed that as a model. And that's why we see so many of our great institutions in the U.S. with, with names of, of philanthropic um, collectors, such as, you know, the Smithsonian or the Guggenheim. And in the 90s, of course, we had a wonderful um, influx of um, public space and buildings, the sort of if you build it, they will come model of the ivory tower. But what's really interesting about like categorizing that past as the past is looking at the discourse that's happening currently today. And the word hub has been brought up several times, um, which is essentially a new definition for museums and for gallery spaces in general. Um, no longer is um, are these places designed for communities? They are designed with communities. Um, they do not speak to communities. They engage in conversation with communities. And it's crucial for the architecture and the design of these spaces and the project teams that um, craft these spaces with communities to, to have that similar representation. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, you really remind us that this is a practice. Uh, designing is designing art architecture as a practice with communities. And it's something that must undergird uh, our institutions now and into the long future. And it really draws us back to Jay's work uh, and Jay looking at art as a provocation for conversation. Sometimes those conversations are challenging. Sometimes those conversations lead to new opportunities uh, for thinking about new ideas about art. Jay, talk to us a bit about how the, pulling together this exhibition with the students opened up a new expression of art on the campus of Wake Forest University and what it means for the department and for the university to host this particular exhibition in the Haynes Gallery. 
Sure, I think a good way to enter that conversation, and we haven't really chat, talk, touched upon it yet, is to think about the theme of the exhibition, and that is portraiture. Um, and I think it's a really kind of a, a interesting way to think about how students kind of came upon this idea, is that early, early in the semester we were discussing W.B. Du Bois's idea of double consciousness, um, an idea he formulated in the late 19th century, and the ways that you know being black in America required reconciling one's African heritage while living in a you know in a um, in a European dominated society. In other words, should a black individual you know try to uh, try to assimilate into white America or, or you know um, or hold on, hold on to traditions and and celebrate African heritage? And so this is the way that that students began to think about um, portraiture and like the ways that um, you know what it might mean to be othered, might mean to be invisible, and the ways that portraiture can can kind of engage those issues. Because uh, you think about it, a portrait is an artist who is looking at another individual or group of individuals and tries to uncover the layers of identity in that person, um, not just sort of a simple stereotypical representation, but trying to understand the contradictions of identity. And I feel like that. That's a sort of was a central idea for uh, for these uh, for these students, and I would like to, love to look up uh, Emma Amos's uh, American Girl image really quick. So I think it's a really again like the Willie Cole uh, encapsulates much of what the students were sort of talking about during the semester. I mean, this etching is a deceptively simple picture um, of a of a black woman with a prominent afro, and in the early to mid 70s, um, you know, an afro was a was a popular and political marker of a black pride. And also it's kind of harder to see if you look closely though, on, to, the, to the right of her, on the right side of the image, I should say, is a schematic American flag. Those dots at the bottom, you know, can recall sort of stars with the sort of stripes at the top right corner of the work. So the print in some ways, when you consider the title as well, um, makes a powerful statement that she is black and American. And I think too, this reminds me when I look at this picture of of a Nicole Hannah Jones's uh, you know, recent essay in the 1619 project that, that was published in the New York Times Magazine. Got a lot of press recently, this, this project, um, where she argues that black Americans are, quote, the most American of all, unquote. Um, and then she states it's for two reasons. Number one, the sort of the violent kidnappings of the slave trade, uh, you know, erased family genealogies and the records of ancestral pasts. So shorn of generational context, um, you, know, um, you know, many, uh, many black Americans can you know, trace their, their family history, you know, to these shores alone, because the, the, the other records are, are lost. And beyond that, she also argues that black Americans have done the really the hard work of, um, of activism, you know, in this country, Dr. King, um, you know, and the traditions, uh, you know, up to the present with Black Lives Matter, um, that, that really have forced our country to live up to these standards. Um, something that the, you know, of course, many of the founding fathers could not live up to those standards um, as being slaveholders. So the short answer to like why this exhibition matters um, right now, why it's important to Wake Forest is, you know, crucial, especially considering that uh, President Hatch apologized on behalf of the institution in February while we're in our seminar, um, apologized for the university's involvement uh, in the slave trade and it's, you know, it's, it's benefiting from the slave trade. And students saw um, their curatorial work as very much part of this context of reckoning. And I'll say one more quick thing too, because I continue to work with students throughout the summer. They were finishing their labels, writing catalog essays and so on and so on. And so of course, when the horrific murder of George Floyd and the protests happened, I think students felt even more, you know, this exhibition was even more urgent. And the idea to, you know, to, to say the names of those who were slain by police, by police officers, you know, the Breonna Taylors, George Floyd, you know, you know, Philando Castile, Eric Gardner, you know, that is like a, a linguistic way of, you know, of a portrait, you know, to state the name is like to paint a picture. And so I think the, those, you know, exhibition could not be more crucially timed um, to, to sort of intervene into this culture and, and ha give Wake Forest students and faculty and staff and Hopefully the wider community, once we're open to the public in the spring, uh, ways to, to discuss these issues. Thank you so much, Jay. You remind us that at Wake Forest University and at all universities, it's not a one-way uh, direction in terms of knowledge flowing from professor to student. It is really students learning from professors. We learn from our staff, colleagues. We learn from other faculties and most important, other faculty, and most, important, we, most importantly, we learn from the broader community. This is where I wanna to turn to Omari, because Omari, when you talk about your gallery, and of course, uh, Elizabeth Catlett and, and her work, 
um, you really talked about the idea of how she's uh, Elizabeth Catlett as an individual part of a broader collective uh, and how that collective is exchanging ideas, practices, techniques. Can you talk to us a bit about uh, what it means for the gallery to be a hub for community and how you uh, begin to engage African-American art through the value of community, through that theme of community and how it opens up and continues to expand the artistic imagination. I think uh, I'll start out just by saying uh, something I didn't mention in my opening comments concerning the gallery, but also the Penn Center that's located down the road. Uh, the Penn Center is not just a school. And so there's certain things in communities that are not just the thing that they appear to be. Uh, the Penn Center uh, during the you know, 50s and 60s, because Black Americans couldn't meet at the Standard Hotel or Holiday Inn, actually became a sanctuary meeting spot for civil rights groups, such as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so you hear people such as Andrew Young speak fondly of their of being at the Penn Center, organizing, figuring out how to help people vote, particularly literacy drives in that particular area, which is connected to voting. Uh, Martin Luther King is said to have penned a, a part of his I, I Have a Dream speech there in one of the cottages that's on the property actually there. Um, I think one of the things that artists do gain from that, it's a community um, of people like them who, who appreciate that uh, what they're doing and it's it's a safe space i also uh, what i often see is the diversity of people who come from far and wide and so not only do you have locals um, you have people as far as wide internationally uh, people like lonnie bunch with the smithsonian to lauren hutton to someone buying something for keith richards um, and people who actually appreciate what they see uh, the contributions of that but it's it's also a thing where people just drop by too um, just drop by if they're coming or a tourist is coming through, they see the gallery. And I will say that it's no longer in existence, but it's different. It's different than other galleries <laughs> you go to. Um, it's, it's definitely open. And actually, if you can kind of look behind me, um, you'll see baskets, uh, crafts that are representative of things you might find in the gallery. And then also to my right and to my left, you see two small um, canvas paintings. Um, by a, actually a trained artist, Jonathan Green. Uh, he's not from St. Helena, but he is from the Sea Islands. He's trained at the Chicago Art Institute, but he basically paints scenes from that particular region, um, from his childhood. And as a, a friend of mine once said, he said he paints people who look like when they woke up, they were looking at rainbows. And so I think that says something about the community, the warmth, and all of those enduring qualities. And in light of what you were also saying too about sort of the connections, I'll connect Jay's comment to something Corey just said. Uh, there, there is this idea of uh, the chain. Another, I guess, symbol we could use is also a river and how a river connects uh, past, present, and future. Uh, there's this poem by Langston Hughes, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, and it cites rivers that exist in Africa, Euphrates, Nile, et cetera, and then goes on to speak about the Mississippi. And I see this continuity um, present in what I see on, on St. Helena Island. Um, I want to turn to the image, the next image, because I want to also circle back. But the, the image of Huey Lee Smith and this picture called The Actress. I'll start out by uh, saying that uh, really he's a mid-century uh, Black artist. Um, but he's different than Catlett in a number of ways in terms of some of the choices uh, that he's made. Um, as I mentioned, some of the other pieces uh, in Catlett's catalog are much more political. Huey Lee Smith is not viewed as being that. Nonetheless, um, he does, not all the time, but he does use often um, Black protagonists or subject matter in some of his paintings. He's also someone who's influenced by European painters. Um, if I pronounce it wrong, uh, was it De Chirico, an Italian, um, where you have these landscapes um, sometimes urban landscapes, sometimes people are at the beach, and you have people in them. But what it does, uh, when you take a look at this, it actually forces you to really think about what is the woman really thinking about here? Uh, did she not get the part? Is she, does she have angst going into it? Um, also, is she, is she uncomfortable? And a lot of 
his subjects tend to look pensive or uncomfortable in certain types of situations. And so although um, probably in his day, some people may have critiqued him, and I'll get back to that, for not being political enough, particularly students. But when you think about it, um, Jay had mentioned this double consciousness that Du Bois talked about um, and that what people have to deal with and the isolation that people can feel in certain types of spaces. And so when I look at some of his other pieces, it makes me think about some of those uh, concepts. Um, circling back to sort of the students um, that Jay mentioned and how the students are engaged with it, um, Lee Smith was indeed an educator as well. Um, he taught at a couple of, several places, but for a short period of time in the late 1960s, he was chair of the art department at Howard University. Uh, it's rumored that his time there was short-lived because uh, the students didn't see him as being radical enough for that time and day. Um, I do want to say, though, in light of that, it's good to have different perspectives, uh, sort of a, uh, what would we call, um, along a spectrum. Um, and people have different ways of communicating different things, and I think that's great. Um, also, I, I circle back to this idea, too, that although we speak about these experiences in the past that are not good, some in the present, indeed, are not good, I want to also highlight what I get from my gallery experience in engaging with the artists and our time together is that a large part of the Black experience is thriving. And I think that's something, too, that's very important to communicate in these ways. And portraiture is something that does that as well. Thank you so much, Omari. You really remind us that art provides us with a kaleidoscope. Uh, it enables us to see those parts of the spectrum that may not be available to us each and every day, but it draws our attention and highlights our attention to those overlooked aspects of beauty that are in the everyday. Imagine waking up to rainbows each and every day. That's a powerful image, but it's an image grounded in a particular institution. Your, the, the Red Piano uh, art, art Two Gallery is more than just an uh, art gallery in a traditional sense. It's a community institution. It brings people together, cultivates the imagination, and nurtures ideas such that individuals may go off to the Art Institute in Chicago and come back, but yet what they learned in Chicago enables them to give expression to the sense of waking up to rainbows in the morning that St. Helena Island implanted in the imagination. It could be uh, Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust bringing in the cinematographer, Arthur Joffer, to begin to develop those broad landscapes across different mediums. And here I want to turn to Jamie. Jamie Omari reminds us that tradi these traditional galleries are more than just a gallery. They're a space of imagination, and as Jay reminded us, they really cultivate and nurture the ideas of students and of communities. Talk to us a bit about developing, what goes into creating these new institutions that really cultivate uh, the imagination and nurture these ideas such that we can begin to imagine new possibilities of community, new possibilities of life together, and new possibilities of what America can be. That's a lot <laughs> right there. And so, and it's something that we're ready to roll up our sleeves and really get um, talking about for sure. I love um, what you just said, Corey, and, and um, we're engaging Omari about the overlooked aspects of beauty, um, because that theme of what is overlooked or what is hidden or you know the untold stories is a huge part of our work and a developing um, um, area of expertise in in the cultural arena um, there are thousands of sites of significance and meaning that um, a passerby could walk past without even recognizing, for example. And so um, being able to locate these places and identify them and find the correct voices to amplify them is, is really crucial. Um, you know, historically, um, these spaces have been um, places for research and preservation and interpretation. 
And the added um, level of engagement here is now they're becoming places of conversation. And I also really liked what Omari was saying about, um, you know, having places um, with debate and discourse because that's exactly the role that museum and galleries can now take on. Um, topics of, of race and religion, and, and we can put up the, the, my, my next image here that I selected, uh, the Jim Alexander Stars and Bars image. You know, the, this is a wonderful example of an image that collectively, whether it's with students or whether it's with neighbors or whether it's with strangers, you know, could could really facilitate some um, amazing, meaningful, hard conversations. Um, and, you know, having these uh, types of works in the background are, are really crucial. Corey, you asked specifically about what goes into creating some of these places. And I think um, a really wonderful example of, of what it takes to, to craft these types of buildings and spaces um, is our current work ongoing in, in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, where our team of designers, including Dayton Schroeder and Montiel Crawley and Julian Arrington, are designing essentially the National Slavery Museum. And this museum is located on the Lumpkin Slave Jail site, which was also known as the Devil's Have Acre. It is one of over 60 um, auction sites located in Shaco Bottom in, in Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, our team um, approached this, and I think a, a general approach to these types of, of new models for spaces are to um, approach it without an answer in mind and to do a lot of listening. And so part of our process and, and part of the process that we partook in, in Richmond was of huge, diverse, and multi-leveled community engagement and conversations. So um, we were able to have large forum community meetings with voting sessions. We were able to have um, wonderful sessions with middle school and high school students in Richmond public schools. Um, to draw upon the local expertise of researchers and historians and folks like yourself, Corey, um, you know, to, to collaborate and to help define what should happen in this place where we have existing archaeology that's been hidden over time. How do we reveal it? How do we tell those hidden and untold stories? How do we tell about the histories of enslavement, but also the legacies of it? So connecting back again to that past, that present, and that future. And, you know, so um, a lot of it is really hard work, and a lot of it takes a long time um, to define and to come up with what the purpose and the mission of a place is even before you put pen to paper and start sketching anything. And I think that's truly at the heart and the core of developing um, engaging museum environments of discourse at this point, is listening first and drawing second. Thank you so much, Jamie. And uh, it, was just, it was just wonderful working with you and the team at Smith Group uh, on the site here uh, in, in Richmond, Virginia. Um, it's interesting. In this conversation, we talk about the students who curated this event, uh, this exhibition, but we also have two alum uh, on tonight's panel, Omari and Jamie. And we have a question in terms of the students and really about a unique opportunity that's been, that, that's, uh, that, that our students have both uh, as undergraduates, but also as broader, as part of a broader Wake Forest community, as professors and as professionals, who are still engaging these salient themes that a new generation of students are wrestling with. We have a question tonight from one of our, our guests joining us, uh, Lucy Alford, who asked this question, and Jay and Omari and Jamie, uh, feel free to respond to it. Lucy's question is, I would like to, I would love to hear a bit more about the title of the exhibition and how it emerged from the student's work. Could the speakers address the place of self and selfhood in the context of the gathering of these works and the larger social issues at hand? This seems particularly important 
given Professor Simonson's insight on Langston Hughes's poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. So Jay, why don't you take a stab at that first? Sure, it's a great question. I mean, I think we actually had a lot of discussions about the title of the exhibition. I remember being on a Zoom, sort of a Zoom class meeting in, you know, in April, and we had the chat, everyone putting suggestions down and really trying to figure out what's something that could capture the richness of this show and also be catchy enough to sort of, you know, um, sort of be look good on a poster. <laughs> Um, and so the idea of explorations of self, we thought, you know, we thought the idea that the portrait explores these various layers, which I mentioned a moment ago, and then we're like, do we should we put an S on that? And then the idea of explorations, and really goes back to that idea of the double consciousness. We have images in the show, perhaps like the, you know, the, um, some of the images we've seen today that show um, African Americans through their own eyes and, you know, in sort of honorific ways. We see images that are from white, you know, maybe the more repressive gaze, you know, of of you know, violence done towards uh, black bodies, the image of a of black face in, in the show. Um, and so I think for us that explorations of self was a way to not just have, you know, just sort of one type of picture, but have a, try to capture sort of a, a range of images that try to speak to the richness and, and the complexity and the, and the, you know, and the, and the, 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 some of the traumatic episodes, traumatic aspects of, of uh, African-American life. Amari, would you like to take a, a, grab, a stab at, at this question with some of your reflections around self and selfhood in the context of community gatherings, uh, as well as in the larger context of uh, community in our contemporary moment? Again, unmute myself. <laughs> um, when I start uh, thinking about it and, and looking at a, a lot of the different images from the collection, but I've also looked at other um, things in the collection as well, um, other works, um, and it's it's really comprehensive. And I think about all the artists at that point in time, particularly those from the, the mid 20th century, and some of them didn't have the type of representation um, that white male artists have, um, but yet they continue to sort of pursue their craft because they saw something else in it in terms of what it could communicate. Um, and so I, I think what it does, it gets those ideas moving, but it also has the potential to sort of lift people up. You know, perhaps if someone goes to a museum, and this is another thing that deals with access. I think it's very important for people of all backgrounds, particularly what Jamie was talking about, how that space and people come to see this, because maybe someone will see themselves in it um, somewhere. And maybe they'll see the struggles that they have today, learning that, okay, maybe, you know, maybe my, my dad is not necessarily um, that uncool. Maybe they know a little bit more about this. Maybe my grandparents know something about what I'm going through today. It also lets you know that you're not alone. Um, but also, I, to Jay's point, I think this concept of really someone's full humanity, um, being able to come to a place where you see that being displayed in all of its complexity. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's not just about tragedy. It's also about triumph. And so there's often this, uh, and I hate to be the person who, says a lot of quotes, but there's this uh, Ralph Ellison quote, I'll paraphrase it, something along the lines of uh, about the human condition. That's really what we're talking about, the mixture of the marvelous and the terrible, and the terrible represents all that hinders hu human aspiration, and the marvelous represents the triumph of the human spirit over the chaos. And so out of that, if you can pull those sorts of themes out of some of these works, I, I think that's great. <laughs> Um, that's great. You can be inspired from it as well. And so I encourage uh, the students and also people in the audience um, to take advantage of this collection and all of its breadth and even go beyond the pieces that these particular students have selected and go deeper. Uh, and I think there are definitely some lessons that we can sort of apply, learn from the past, apply to the present, and hopefully change some things for the future for the better. Thank you so much, Amari. Jamie, I want to turn to you. Uh, in light of uh, Jay and Omari's response to that question, uh, to really uh, ask you to talk a bit about how your work with these sites of memory really enable us to begin to project and understand the fullness, the depth, and the complexity of being human, even in some of our uh, challenging moments throughout our uh, past our continuing present, and the aspirations we have for a better future. 
Um, so I, I think you throw me the most challenging questions, Corey, because <laughs> these are really tough topics. Sites of memory are really um, um, difficult spaces to work around, right? Because it, it all depends on whose memory you're, you're speaking of, correct? And, and when, we, when we work with museums and when we work with artists or when we tell um, histories or stories, um, voice, authorship, and you know, whose, whose memory you're speaking to is a really crucial um, part of the understanding. And you know, to, to grapple with those themes, we always do a ton of research we always engage with um, as many local experts as possible, but we also hear back from other perspectives other than ours. You know, architects can be incredibly jaded individuals sometimes. And, um, you know, I think we're notorious for being known to have, think that we have all the answers. And, you know, what's, what's truly meaningful is when you can realize that a place is about and for more than just yourself, you collaborate with others to begin to define, um, you know, what is significant about this place and to begin to have discussions with community members, but also young people who have incredible perspective about sites of conscience, sites of memory, um, historic sites, and what they want to see and how they want to learn. One of the most meaningful things in, in Richmond was our engagement with high school students um, on the subject of slavery and to hear directly from them that the interpretation should first of all acknowledge um, and that acknowledgement and recognition were two of the most important themes that they wanted to see, um, uh, you, know, um, ex you know, personified in this architectural space. Um, the second one was that um, the students really wanted to see the truth and not to be, not to have any information withheld from them. And I think that that was a really poignant thing to say as well. They wanted to be able to touch the archeology. span They wanted to be able to grapple um, with the history. And then the third moment of them, what we really gained from them was this notion of healing and resistance. That, you know, acknowledgement, leading to an understanding to healing and and sort of like through resistance was very, very important for them. Um, so sites of memory are um, and um, difficult topics are always difficult to design around, but the more voices you can have that help you personify um, that and create a space that is active, that to Amari's point that people can see themselves in that you know isn't concentrational in and of itself. Um, you know that people can see themselves enjoying and being a part of that space um, it are are crucial themes for our work. Thank you so much, Jamie. And you have those questions simply because I know you have the answers. <laughs> we have another wonderful question from uh, one of our guests who joined us this evening. Uh, and Jay, it's uh, directed to you, and, and I'd like to read the question uh, from Dorothy, who gives us a wonderful question. Uh, Dorothy writes, uh, Jay, you stated that stating the name is like painting the picture. In relation to our current moment and re in relation to Black Lives Matter, can you uh, or other panelists uh, address how the current situation not only informs this exhibition, but how is it transforming the ways in which we think about art and our uh, curatorial and design practices? That's a great question. I mean, as I mentioned briefly, just um, you know, working with students over the summer, it was just all of a sudden this exhibition came that much more urgent. And I actually forgot to show this, this kind of a, this, the new Vanity Fair cover with Amy Sherald's portrait of Breonna Taylor. And so I think some of these ideas about, um, about painting the picture is kind of like saying, you know, is the perhaps the artistic equivalent of saying one's name um, is sort of really interestingly put there by, by the artist Amy Sherald. Um, I just think that the way that art is, you know, uh, many uh, African-American artists have been interested in politics and thinking about how to use art to, you know, to try to change social norms, to fight against racism. But I think those, um, those battles have become, you know, really urgent in the past few years. Um, 
I mean, actually, kind of goes back to the early, the mid 1990s, the 90, 1993 uh, Whitney uh, Biennial with Glenn Ligon and other artists like that. Um, but I'm thinking of artists like Dred Scott or Titus Kafar, who are these artists who are really in, interested in investigating history and trying to bring these repressed histories back, like the uh, like Dred Scott's uh, Slave Rebellion reenactment, which he did last fall in Louisiana, um, where he basically created a community of over 100 reenactors dressed up, you know, in period period costumes with 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 um, with fake rifles and swords and rake and marched through Louisiana, ending up in, the, in, in a square in New Orleans. And so there's ways to bring this sort of repressed history, the slave revolt that no one's really, like, written, you know, that, that is not taught in schools. And um, so I think these really bringing to light these repressed histories is so important to artists today as a way to like uh, reinvestigate our past as a way to better the future. And I'll just kind of, uh, to make, to, like, to um, give Amari some company, I'll read one more, I'll read a quote as well. Um, by the great philosopher Walter Benjamin in 1940, he wrote, there is no document of civilization, which is not at the same time a document of barbarism, unquote. I think this idea that everything we look around has a, you know, has a darker history. And I think you know, African-American artists have always been on the forefront of investigating that, but I think it's so urgent right now. Thank you so much, Jay. Omari, you want to respond? And Jamie, I, I really want you to talk about the recent um, installation uh, in Washington, D.C. by Smith Group. So, Omari? Um, yeah, I, I can speak to it. I, I don't know if I have the, uh, the answer to it because I, I think it, there's this tension. You know, sometimes even when you look at artwork, sometimes it doesn't give you the answer. Sometimes it's not supposed to do that. Sometimes you're supposed to be uneasy. And so, as I mentioned, sort of the Lee Smith of paintings. But one thing I, I, I want to reference uh, for the person asking what relevance does it have to Black Lives Matter, I think I think if you're thinking about protest, but also um, speaking truth to power, Elizabeth Catlett is a good place to look for that sort of inspiration. Um, someone who had her citizenship, wasn't able to return to her own country, to even attend her own mother's funeral, um, but nonetheless um, did not ever really waver from those commitments um, to, to her people. And so I think that's very important. I wish I, I had it another image to cue up because I want to paint a scene for you. There's a 1950s um, lino cut print by Elizabeth Catlett. Now, um, 1950s, she was doing things through 2009. So it shows you how prolific she was and how long her career was and how long she was in the struggle. Um, but the 1950s lino cut, it's titled Civil Rights Congress. And I'm going to describe it. It has like a, a little boy, probably like a 10 year old black boy who's sitting on a chair. Um, and behind him are flames, a, a burning cross, hoods. And then there's also over top of him is basically the Grim Reaper and a, a skeletal hand reaching out for him. But behind um, the skeleton is a black man grabbing the arm and pushing it away from the young boy. Now, if you think about 1950s, uh, you know, we're talking for one period of time, people talked about voting. Before voting was an issue, civil rights issue, voting's always been an issue, but lynching has been one as well. And so a lot of civil rights organizations were addressing that. So this is a 1950s print, but what it is, it's actually in honor. It looks, um, it looks very, actually it looks scary, but really what it is, it's an honorary thing because the man who's behind the young boy is a man by the name, I believe, of William Patterson, and he's an attorney. And he's an attorney who represented the Scottsboro Nine in Alabama, um, nine boys who were um, basically charged, charged with rape, um, wrongfully charged. And he basically led their defense. And so if you wanna talk about, and he was a leader of an organization called the Civil Rights Congress. You often hear about the NLACP. There were other civil rights organizations that had different, different areas of expertise and sometimes different tactics that they used. But if you could think about William Patterson, probably back then, and this is the 1930s I'm talking about, he was probably the equivalent of what you think about Brian Stevenson today. Um, but he was doing this sort of in the shadows, not in the social media environment, but actually working tirelessly in the background to make sure that he was saving lives. And I think there is something to be learned um, by that and some inspiration to get from that as well that aligns um, with what some of the activists are doing today and young people as well. I think the goal is to carry those things that those people do and carry it forward. And so Brian Stevenson stands on the shoulders of people like William Patterson 
And similarly, the young people today, you stand on the shoulders of people like Brian Stevenson. Thanks so much, Amari and Jay. Uh, Jamie, talk to us a bit about the uh, in, in place uh, exhibition that was uh, that your group helped curate and develop uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the height of this contemporary moment. Sure. So um, to the point about uh, the current situation in Black Lives Matter, um, you know, to step back a couple years, I mean, I think we've seen throughout our country a uh, thirst for telling um, untold stories before. And we saw the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which Smith Group was part of the collaborative team that, that um, brought forth that project. Um, we've seen the National Memorial for Peace and Justice open, you know, so we've seen um, wonderful memorial um, landscape and built environments that can help to uh, facilitate conversation and tell stories. Um, what we've seen this year is a true amplification of, of the thirst. Um, for this type of dialogue. And I think we've seen that through um, the protests um, that followed the, the murder of George Floyd and others. Um, and for our group um, at Smith Group, it was a uh, team of designers, um, Dayton, Julian, Montiel, Ivan, and Julieta, who got together one day and were wondering about protest at, it, you know, at its crux, at its heart and thought of themselves, how, how can we use our craft? How can we use architecture as protest? And so they gathered together and embarked in early June upon a uh, design exercise to create a space, a pavilion, if you will, um, that provided an opportunity for education, but also for empathy. Um, it's called Society's Cage. Um, and what happened was that they were able to, and Smith Group sponsored their efforts. Um, we just, you know, we were not the authors of it as a firm. These black architects were the authors of the art piece itself, and Smith Group chose to, to sponsor and help facilitate this installation um, to happen. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be able to get a permit to showcase the, the pavilion um, on the National Mall. And so it was a wonderful installation that um, opened the day of the Black Lives Matter March in late August and was open for two weeks um, that really facilitated a lot of wonderful um, um, you know, dialogue, very small 15 by 15 by 15 box, um, lots of interpretive material about police brutality and about societal injustice. Um, all within the backdrop of our nation's capital and the Washington Monument. Um, so I invite everybody to, to check that out online. Thank you so much, Jamie. And Jamie, um, we have a wonderful and interesting question for you. And you can bring a very distinctive uh, response to this because uh, you speak to it both as a professional in, in art and architecture and design, as well as an alum of the university. And we have a question from uh, one of our guests who joined us, Mary Tribble, one of our colleagues. And Mary writes, I'm interested in hearing uh, from Jamie about how she might approach a reinterpretation of Wake Forest's history at the Wake Forest Historical Museum. You know, we've learned a lot about the university and its past. What would be important to you and what would be some of those first steps in doing that? That's a really great question. And I think the recognition that um, Jay mentioned and Corey and Amari have mentioned, the recognition by the university is the first step, you know, um, of recognizing and acknowledging the history. Um, the other amazing thing about Wake Forest is it has an entire team already in place. <laughs> it has an entire team of students. It has an entire team of art historians. It has wonderful research opportunities, um, you know, on its campus currently. And um, to be able to pull um, and to use this as a true learning moment for students would be an incredible, incredible opportunity. 
to begin to research, you know, to do the academic portion of it, but also um, to do things that some of the other institutions throughout the country have been doing. A great example is James Madison's Montpelier um, and their designation and amplification of a descendant advisory board um, to be pulling these voices um, from the local community, from the descendants um, and you know, uh, the, the generations and pooling them all together to first of all define what should be done and developing a, a, a purpose or a mission for the project in essence. And then through that definition, holding yourselves accountable and then designing and thinking about what aspects do you want to interpret. Um, it would be an extraordinary learning moment for students um, it would be an extraordinary partnership moment for other academic institutions um, in the Winston-Salem uh, community um, and, you know, in North Carolina in general. But I, I would think that the university would be quite excited about that. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, as you, as you uh, correctly stated, it's an opportunity for the entire university and the broader community to begin to learn about the depth and the complexity of our history and also open up new possibilities for a brighter, more hopeful future for all of, all of us uh, in the Winston-Salem and greater triad region. Well, folks, we've uh, almost exhausted an hour uh, and 15 minutes, but we have one last question that I wanna pose to you and I wanna go to Jay first because Jay, I think you have an image that'll fit this question uh, beautifully. This question is from uh, again, one of our guests uh, gathered with us, Lorreen Crawford. And it's a, a question around the practices of museum spaces. And she writes, do you ever feel that there's a way in which art exhibited in the US is not always, uh, that can't always, can't always meet the constraints of exhibiting African-American art or art from non-mainstream or traditionally uh, understood artistic groups in galleries and in uh, museums. In other words, does traditional galleries collapse the space for, for, uh, for actually exhibiting African-American art? And what can we do in light of that? It's a great question. I think it also goes back to what Jamie was saying earlier, the origins of the museum. I mean, the, you know, the idea of the white cube gallery is all about keeping out the outside. You know, that should not intrude upon our appreciation of the formal qualities of the artwork. So right off the bat, like just showing this kind of, you know, showing African-American art in a gallery, it's kind of, you know, it has to somehow, you know, contend with that long history of what, you know, of the, of the origins of the art museum. But having said that, can I cue the, uh, the image up, uh, DL? So I think a great example of this is sort of the, so the activist cur uh, curating of Fred Wilson, a really important uh, you know, uh, African-American artist. In 1992, in this canonical work that all, you know, that I think museum professionals and art historians um, you know, know this work well, um, he was invited by the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore to come into the museum and go through their storage and find objects that had not been seen, that had been repressed, that had not been on view. And he was invited to organize those, the, those objects uh, in the main display. Um, so what he did here, you look at this display that says metalwork, 1793 to 1880. You see beautiful sterling silver tankards and mugs and goblets, you know, just uh, you know, the objects of luxury. And there in the foreground, it's kind of hard to see, but you see a pair of slave shackles. And these are two forms of metalwork. And so what Fred Wilson is saying here, one of the many things he's saying here is that the, you know, the labor of enslaved Africans, you know, created the wealth that allowed for these, these, you know, these, these in Maryland, um, the Maryland elites to afford these, this silver service. And so I think, you know, instead of putting these various objects in different containers in different rooms and different, you know, um, in different sort of plexiglass vitrines, it's important to think about these histories together and only by sort of recognizing sort of the ways that, you know, that, uh, that beauty also has to do with violence and hate um, and re in repression, that's like a, an important step for, I think, for museums to, um, to energize and to charge and inspire their viewers for change. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jay. Omari, would you like to talk to that and also offer us some uh, closing remarks on your aspirations for what this exhibition means and also what do you hope will come out of uh, this exhibition? To the question specifically uh, about kind of museum uh, spaces, um, I, I will say it, it, it extends, it, it's deeper than that too. It also goes to uh, collectors, um, collectors, people supporting black artists so that they can continue to practice their craft, et cetera, providing opportunities, opportunities for training, providing venues, providing representation. I think that's, those are also things that come into the discussion of continuing to make sure that these voices end up being, being heard. Um, the idea about the traditional gallery, well, I wasn't co-owner of a traditional one. And so, as I said, it was, it was special in, in that sense. And so I think everybody felt comfortable um, in there. Um, from no matter what, um, what your particular preference was, people felt comfortable there. Having said that, I will say this is that it's one of those things I, I hear oftentimes from young people uh, about the idea of going into a room um, and feeling that uh, they shouldn't be there um, necessarily. And there's all this talk and I mean, there's all this talk about being an imposter. Um, that word wasn't something when I was coming up, but I will say to you is that there's no room that you walk in that you shouldn't be in there. And that's the mindset you have to have. And that's the mindset a lot of these artists have and continuing to do what they did and making the choices, knowing that other people probably didn't want to pay attention to it, probably did not want to be confronted with what are sometimes in some uncomfortable ideas. But I think the idea that we're talking about some of these people right now speaks to the fact that they were right. Um, similarly, in terms of um, traditional spaces, I'll give you an example. Um, Asheville Art Museum, when you get an opportunity um, I would say go to it when you have an opportunity because it's a modern museum, big white spaces, but in the atrium is a piece called My Big Black America by Wesley Clark. So the atrium, when you walk in, there is a, what is an American, um, basically you know, a map of the United States of America in wood, a wood sculpture that the dimensions of it are humongous. It is probably, I'm trying to think, probably like 25, um, high by 50 and it just stares right at you. And so it's in one of those spaces and it's beautiful. And so the idea there about being uncomfortable, our spaces, I say to those who cares, um, the, the artists themselves don't. And I think that's necessary to have that type of mentality moving forward. How, what do I hope um, that students and others get out of this? I'll come back to, I'm not gonna say another quote, I promise. But I will say in finishing, in finishing up, I think in looking at art, just things about the human experience, and this spans beyond race, class, gender, et cetera, that um, we are confronted um, with uh, the terrible, uh, we acknowledge it, but hopefully through looking through these wonderful pieces of beauty that we also discover the marvelous. And so that's what I hope students and the audience can all experience by seeing this exhibit and others like it. Thank you so much, Amari. Jamie, how can we begin to develop and democratize and deepen the democratic spaces and possibilities of galleries, uh, as well as art museums and exhibitions? And as an alum, what's your hope mm -hmm. for uh, the cur your current Wake Forest students, what they will receive out of this exhibition? Um. I think uh, to the first point, you know, neutral is not neutral. And I think we always think of the white cube um, of gallery spaces as being a neutral place. But I think there's been recognition that that's not neutral, um, you know, and that, uh, you know, neutral could very easily be defined as a place where two opposing forces or, or, or forces sort of like meet. And, and there's, you know, friction and tension and collaboration. Um, when you think about the neutral axis, um, you know, on a structural beam, and I'm going to nerd out on you a little bit architecturally, you know, that's the place where tension and compression, the opposing forces meet. And so, you know, if we turn neutrality and if we, you know, on its head, and if we turn the, the definition of a museum on its head, we can get a little bit closer 
to a definition of places that are far more accessible. And by accessible, I'm meaning lots of different types of accessibility. Um, you know, we, and we can do that through playing with scale and surface and color um, and materiality. And um, through those engaging dialogues with, with um, the communities, develop places where people can see themselves and can feel like they are a part of it. And that's a true democratic space. You know, I think film does this really well. You know, film captures and harnesses nostalgia. It captures and harnesses memory. It has a temporal quality. And so when you look at whether it's pop culture music videos like Beyonce at the Louvre or where, whether you're talking about exhibit design like Fred Wilson's, um, you know, work, um, being able to juxtapose, um, you know, two various things or two different things together is a wonderful avenue to begin to talk about like whether it's democracy or whether it's a new sort of typology for space. Um, what do I want Wake Forest students to learn from this? Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, that um, to be a part of the process is um, as meaningful as being an author, um, you know, to help facilitate and to gather together, whether it's voices or works of art um, and be a part of like, you know, something that's bigger than oneself is, is, is really, really valuable. Um, also to think about um, works of art in spaces and about the audience that may be approaching these spaces. Um, you know, I know that, that Paul Bright and I know Jay and I know all of the professors at Wake are consistently asking the students to think about these things, um, but it's really crucial and important in, in developing the future of gallery spaces and museums and um, also, you know, developing new typologies. Thank you so much, Jane. Jay, we opened up with you and you informed us about the ideas that really shaped and formed this exhibition about the work of a group of students who uh, worked through a pandemic uh, to put this exhibition together. Um, talk to us a bit about uh, the transformation that you undertook uh, in preparing for this work. You talked a bit about it at the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. And what do, you, what do you hope this exhibition will do for the broader Wake Forest community? A couple of things. I mean, I think for just, you know, I kind of see it, it has rippling effects, micro, macro, and so on and so on. On a, on a micro level, I want this exhibition to open the eyes to the art department. And we want to we want a place, we want a continue to diversify our Wake Forest art collections and also have a space, go back to what Jamie said, have a space for, you know, not just the Haynes Gallery, but a place to study and to research, you know, the, the art of unrepresented, you know, um, unrepresented groups. And that is so important for an institution um, to have researchers in to do, the, do, the, do, the, do that kind of work. Um, but also, I think from the conversations generated by this exhibition, ideally we want, you know, um, this to also lead to, um, you know, further lines of higher in terms of faculty, um, maybe to, you know, for your new uh, African American Studies Department or program, Corey, to give you free will to hire as many people as you'd like to begin to, you know, to, to decolonize our curriculum. I mean, there's so, many, so much work to be done here, and I think there are incre incremental steps to be taken, as, as Jamie mentioned, but I think the first step is discussion, a space, and then sort of that can begin to ripple out and really transform the culture at Wake Forest. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Omari. Thank you, Jamie, uh, for a wonderful and stimulating conversation. And truly, conversations are very important because they're risk-filled endeavors, and they're risk-filled because we enter them one way, and we may end them and totally transform. I've learned a lot from each of you, and I've learned a lot from your references to our wonderful Wake Forest students. And Jay, Tell us a bit, give us some of the mechanics about the exhibition. When does it go up? Uh, how long it's open? Uh, how, hope, what do we hope to do in light of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Well, in terms of access, right now it's only accessible to Wake Forest students, staff, and faculty. Um, but if you are one of those groups, um, you can come visit it right now. Um, hopefully by the spring, it's going to be open until March 28th. So hopefully by the spring, fingers crossed, we can open this to the wider, broader community. Um, so. Check, you know, check the Hands Together website, um, but I'm, we're, we're really hoping that 
by the spring, that's gonna, that's gonna happen. So um, definitely come. And also mention one more quick thing. At the end of the exhibition, students uh, decided to put a discussion table with, with post-it notes and things like that to post people's thoughts about the exhibition and ideas and you know, what, what inspired them and you know, what thoughts were provoked. And so I think it's another great example of students to kind of think a little bit outside of what their normal experiences are in museums to try to, again, engage spectators and try to really foster those conversations that, that need to happen. Thank you so much, Jay. Once again, thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Omari, for your wonderful comments and critical and thought-provoking ideas. I also want to thank our technical crew who worked with us tonight, uh, D.L. Dillingham and Steve Morrison. They really put this together and pulled this together seamlessly. And I want to thank uh, our silent partner in all, throughout all of this, Christina Soriano. Christina is the Director of Dance and Associate Professor uh, of Dance and Associate Provost for the Arts and Interdisciplinary Programs. I want to thank Christina for her work bringing us, bringing us all together and enabling us to uh, convene this conversation, along with our partners at the Wake Forest University Slavery, Race, and Memory Project, co-chaired by Cami Chavis, who's Professor of Law in the School of Law, as well as Associate Provost for Academic Initiatives, and Tim Piott. Tim is Dean of the Z. Smith Reynolds Library. So we want to thank everyone for bringing us together. If DL will go to the image that opened us up, Mel Edwards Chains. Now, I opened us up with this image for, for one thing. I wanted to talk about Mel Edwards and the opportunity to begin to engage his thought, his work, and his invitation for us to think together this evening. Indeed, Edwards has, uh, Edwards' invitation was taken up by all of us this evening, but Edwards reminds us something about, about chains. And he says, and I repeat, I am always aware that it's got a symbolic reading that's hard to get people away from. So I don't try to get them away, but the word chain is a device for connecting. If you metaphorically define chains, they become love, chain of love, chain of fools, chain, chain, chain. It's also symbolically chains of kinship, chains of linkage. The problem is not the chain, it's how people use it. Edwards reminds us not only of the prop that chains are not the problem, but its usage, but he also gestures toward possibilities. And I drew on Mel Edwards because Edwards part in this particular exhibition and as part of the Conquering Collection reminds us of another linkage. It links Wake Forest University to Winston-Salem State University. For Mel Edwards' Southern Sunrise, his 1984 commissioned sculpture lies in the Haines, is outside at the Haynes Gallery on the campus of Winston-Salem State University. Winston-Salem State University has the largest collection of African-American landscape art of any college uh, campus in North Carolina. With Mel Edwards Chains, he reminds us that we at Wake Forest are linked to Winston-Salem State. Mel Edwards is our link, but our links are deeper, broader, and more diverse than we could ever have imagined. I wanna thank each of our guests for joining us for this wonderful and inspiring conversation this evening. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us for this conversation and continue to take up the invitation to think together so that we can then build a brighter, more promising future for us all. My name is Corey Walker. Thank you and good night.